the Battle of Tamsi or Battle of Hope fought on 8 October 1884, was a significant French defeat during the Sino-French War. Background The Battle of Tamsi was part of the Keelung Campaign. Following the outbreak of the Sino-French War on 23 August 1884, the French decided to put pressure on China by landing an expeditionary corps in northern Formosa to seize Keelung and Tamsui. On 1 October Lieutenant Colonel Berto Lavalaine landed at Keelung with a force of 1,800 Marine infantry forcing the Chinese to withdraw to strong defensive positions which had been prepared in the surrounding hills. Meanwhile, a second French force under the command of Rear Admiral Sébastien Lespès prepared to attack Tamsui. Luming Xuan took measures to reinforce Tamsui. In the river nine torpedo mines were planted and the entrance was blocked with ballast boats filled with stone which were sunk on September 3rd. Matchlock-armed, Hacker Hill people, were used to reinforce the mainland Chinese battalion, and around the British Consulate and Customs House at the Red Fort Hilltop. Shanghai Arsenal manufactured Krupp guns were used to form an additional battery. At Tamsui, the entrance of the river had been closed by laying down six torpedoes in the shape of a semicircle on the inside of the bar. The Douglas steamers Fokian and Heilong running to the port, as well as the German steamer Vela, were, whenever necessary, piloted over the torpedoes by the Chinese who had laid him down. The Mandarins engaged in planting the guns that had been brought to the island by the latter steamer. Trade was resumed during the middle of the month at Tuatusha, it being regarded for the time as safe, and the country thereabouts had quieted down to such an extent that a good deal of tea was brought in. Life for the foreigners was very much cramped. They were prohibited from making trips into the country, and even in the settlement, with religious processions, crackers, and gongs going at all times of day, and the watchmen making a great noise with bamboos all night. Rest was well nigh impossible except to the Chinese guards told off to protect foreign Hongs, who after disappearing all day, except at meal times, return at night, and instead of guarding the property, turn in early and sleep as soundly as Rip Van Winkle did till morning, under the impression that the French would attempt to enter the Tamsi River. Ballast boats and junks loaded with stones were sunk at the entrance. A number of hacker hillmen were added to the government force. They were armed with their own matchlocks, which in their ignorance they preferred to foreign rifles. Much was expected of them, as the life of warfare they had led on the savage border had trained them to be good shots and handy with their knives. By the end of August the French had succeeded in holding the shoreline at Kelung, but were unable to advance beyond it, and as Chinese soldiers had for some days been erecting earthworks and digging entrenchments on the hills on the east side of the bay overlooking the shipping. The French sent word ashore for the Europeans to come on board the Bayard, as they intended opening fire on the earthworks which were now just visible, one the firing was not successful either that day or the next. The nature of the country being in favour of the Chinese, and for many days the shelling was a regular event. The Chinese not apparently suffering much damage themselves, or being able to inflict any upon the French. This condition of affairs continued through September, the French having gained only the summits of the near hills surrounding the harbour. General Lu Ming Xuan left Kelung on the 9th to visit Tamsui and Taipfu. On his arrival at the latter place he was met at the wharf by some 200 soldiers, five buglers, and two or three drummers. The march up the street with the soldiers in front, the band next, and the general in the rear in his chair, made an imposing parade. His presence is also said to have had a most stimulating effect on the soldiers on guard in the foreign Hongs. All appeared in full force with uniforms and rifles. Although for several days the muster in one Hong had produced only one soldier and a boy in a soldier's coat. James W. 
Davidson, the island of Formosa, past and present, Lu Ming Xuan with some 6,000 men was stationed at Type Few in the Banker Plain, while the forces at Ho were daily strengthened, until, in the middle of October, there were assembled about 6,000 men in the neighborhood. Among these were new levies of Hakka Hillmen. They were considered by the foreigners to be a dangerous lot to have in the neighborhood, and as they did not speak the same language as the general and other officers, it was feared that misunderstandings might arise with serious results. The other soldiers present were principally northern men, and were said to be well armed. The Hakkas, although armed with their primitive matchlocks, were considered to be brave men and were hardened to the privations of warfare. Their matchlocks are described as long-barreled guns, fixed into semicircular shaped stocks, with pans for priming powder, and armlets made of rattan, worn around the right wrist and containing pieces of bark cord, which, when lighted, would keep alight for hours, if necessary. When in action the hacker pours a charge of powder down the muzzle, on top of that are dropped two or three slug shot or long pieces of iron. Without wadding, the trigger is made to receive the lighted piece of bark, and when powder covers the priming pan and all is ready, the trigger is pulled and if, if the weather is dry, off goes the gun. The ordinary method of handling these weapons is to place the lower end of the butt against the right breast high enough to enable the curved end to rest against the cheek, and the eye to look down the large barrel, upon which there are ordinarily no sights. This method is sometimes varied by discharging the guns from the hip, and it is quite customary for the hacker to lie flat on his back, place the muzzle between his toes, and, raising his head sufficiently to sight along the barrel, to take deliberate aim and fire. He is able to make good practice, while his presence, especially when surrounded by rank grass, is decidedly difficult to determine. Rev. Dr. Mackay's Tamsi Mission Hospital, with Dr. Johansson in charge, which had rendered such great services to the Chinese wounded and had no doubt been the means of saving many lives was visited on the 19th by General Sun, who thanked the doctor in charge as well as Dr. Brown of the Cockcliffe for their attentions to the sick and wounded. The patients then numbered only a dozen, a good many of the wounded having left, fearing that the French might land again and kill them. Others, seeing their wounds healing nicely, went away into the town. One man who had been shot through the left shoulder, in the region of the collarbone, after a week or ten days treatment suddenly shouldered his rifle and left for the front, preferring life with his comrades to being confined in the hospital. It was supposed that the bullet had pierced the upper part of his lungs. Another instance occurred seven days after the French landing, when the Chinese walked into the hospital with his skull wounded and the brain visible. Several others, shot through the thighs and arms, bones being splintered in many pieces, bore their pain most heroically. Soon after the engagement, when there were 70 men in the hospital, some being badly wounded with as many as three shots apiece, there was scarcely a groan to be heard. One of the wounded came to the hospital after having had a bullet in his calf for nine or ten days. Dr. Brown extracted the bullet, and off the man went back to the front. Many other instances like the foregoing might be recorded, all of which indicated that the Chinese could recover in a few days from wounds, which, if not actually fatal, would have laid foreign soldiers up for months. Davidson, the island of Formosa, past and present, the bombardment of Tamsui, the 2nd of October 1884. On the 1st of October 1884, while the Formosa Expeditionary Corps went ashore at Keelung, Lesbes lay off Tamsui with the ironclads Largalis on the A in Triomphanti, the cruiser Destaring and the gunboat Viper. His orders from Corbett were to bombard the Chinese forts at Tamsui, destroy the barrage across the Tamsui River and seize Tamsui itself. The town of Tamsui had a population of around 6,000 at this period, including a small European colony. Tamsui was defended by two major forts, both to the west of the town. The White Fort, so called by the French to distinguish it from Fort Saint Domingo. 
the 17th century Spanish red fort that had become the premises of the British consulate in Tamsui was a shore battery that commanded the entrance to the Tamsui River. To the northeast, defending the town against a landing, was a fort still under construction, the New Fort. Although the New Fort was only partly armed, it had an excellent all-round field of fire. Other important fortification works had been built on all the neighboring ridges. The arrival of the French flotilla was the signal for feverish activity ashore. As the Chinese worked throughout the afternoon and evening to arm the new fort and deployed their troops to repel any attempt to land by the French, the European residents of Tam Sui, many of whom were British, hastily hung out Union Jacks from their houses to signal their neutrality to the French ships. As the French warships were unable to enter the Tamsui River, Lespes decided to bombard the White Fort and the New Fort on the morning of 2 October. In fact, hostilities were begun by the Chinese, who began firing at sunrise on 2 October with three cannon, which they had placed in the barbette of the New Fort the previous evening. The French flotilla immediately replied, delivering a heavy bombardment which lasted for several hours, eventually destroying the three Chinese guns and putting both the new fort and the white fort out of action. More than 2,000 shells were fired against the two forts. Many failed to explode on impact and remained dangerous for days afterwards. Others missed their targets, because the bombardment was delivered from long range, and damaged many buildings in Tam Sui itself, including all the European residences. The Canadian Presbyterian missionary George Mackay remained in his house in Tam Sui during the French bombardment, refusing to take shelter aboard the British gunboat HMS Cockchafer anchored off Tam Sui, because he could not take his foremost and converts with him. He left a vivid description of the attack. When the bombarding began we put our little children under the floor of the house that they might not be alarmed. My wife went out and in during these trying hours, I paced the front of the house with a hoa while shot and shell wisdom burst all around us. One shell struck a part of Oxford College, another a corner of the girls' school, and still another a stone in front of us and sent it into mid-air in a thousand atoms. A little to the west of us another went into the ground, gouging a great hole and sending up a cloud of dust and stones. The suction of one, as it passed was like a sudden gust of wind. Amid the smoke from forts and ships, and the roar and thunder of shot and shell, we walked to and fro, feeling that our God was round about us. George Mackay, from Far Formosa, Mackay said later, in a conversation recorded by the Anglican missionary William Campbell, that the French marksmanship had been very inaccurate, and had recklessly endangered the lives of innocent civilians. French preparations for a landing at Tamsui, 2-7 October 1884, realizing that his naval bombardment had failed to achieve its objective, and as he had only a small landing force at his disposal, Admiral Lespes sent Destaring back to Keelung on the evening of 2 October to request reinforcements of a battalion of marine infantry to enable him to make a landing to the north of the river, seize the forts, then destroy the command post from which the mines could be detonated. The French could then clear the pass by exploding a large powder charge, and the ships could enter the river. Meanwhile, he attempted to neutralize the mines himself. On the evening of 2 October the gunboat Viper scouted the pass and located the boys of the mines. On the following night the launchers tried to drag the electric wires. They failed, and one of them was almost destroyed when the Chinese exploded one of the mines at a distance. Destaring reached Keelung on the afternoon of 3 October. By then the French had already secured the hills to the west of the town and the Chinese had retreated. But Corbett was reluctant to release one of his three battalions of marine infantry. It was probably the correct decision, though it would later be criticized. Although the Chinese had momentarily fallen back, they might launch a counterattack at any moment, and if they did the French would need every man to hold the extensive defense perimeter they had just established a key lung. 
Corbett nevertheless did what he could to give Lespers a respectable landing force. He sent him three more ships, which arrived off Tamsui on the evening of 5 the October. They carried their own landing companies and also the landing company from Bayard, giving Lespers a total of 600 men available for shore operations. Lespers thereupon began making preparations for a landing to assault the defences of Tamsui and clear the mines from the mouth of the Tamsui River. He organised the 600 sailors available for a landing into a battalion of five companies under the command of Capitaine de Frégate Martin of La Galissonnière, who had commanded the landing force at Quilung on 5 August with distinction. The ironclads Bayard, La Galissonnière and Triomphant each supplied one company. The smaller vessels Destaring and Chateau Renault provided a fourth company, and Tan and Du Guaitro and a fifth. The Chinese defences at Tamsui. The Chinese defence was commanded by General Sun Kiy Wa, who had been responsible for building the new fort in 1876. He was assisted by General Chang Kao Yuan and Brigadier General Lu Chao Yuan, Lu Ming Chuan's great nephew. According to Lu Ming Chuan's official report of the battle, the Chinese force included the Chosheng Regiment whose commanders included Kung Chang'ao, Li Tingming and Fan Huiyi. Two other regular battalions from different regiments were also present, under the direct command of Chang Kao Yuan and Liu Chao Yuan. A battalion of Formosan hillmen, recently enrolled by Li Tiongen, also fought in a skirmishing role, under the command of Chang Li Cheng. The Chinese force seems to have numbered around 1,000 infantry in total. Sun Kiy Wa deployed the Chosheng Regiment in the front line. He entrenched one line of infantry in front of Fort San Domingo facing northwest, the direction from which a French assault was expected, and placed a second line of infantry in wooded terrain on the right flank, almost at a right angle to the main Chinese trenches where it could enfilade the French advance before it reached the main defences. According to Lu Ming Chuan's report, Kung Chang Ao's division was posted at a spot known as the False Creek, and Li Ting Ming's division lay in ambush at Uchikao. Neither locality can now be identified. Sun Kiy Wa commanded the regiment's defence in person. Behind Fort San Domingo, Chang Kao Yuan and Liu Chao Yuan lay in reserve with two battalions of regulars, each from a different regiment, ready to counter-attack when the moment was ripe. Chang Li Cheng's hillmen were posted close to the shore in the hills to the north of the main Chinese positions, enabling them to skirmish against the left flank of the advancing French. These were intelligent dispositions, well chosen to repulse a frontal attack.